feel free. Ram Anadon. First of all. I want to thank you, the executive board of IFSO. Right. Well, it is 13.30, so I'm just Perfect. going to, to make, a, make a start in the interest of, um, of time and, and, and respecting everybody's time. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kamal Mahawar. I'm the chief coordinator of TUGS. Uh, and today we are here to listen to yet another highly uh, um, successful TUGS Talks uh, episode, and, and we have with us today Professor Natan Zandal from from USA, who is originally from from Colombia. I know as a great friend of mine. To introduce the program, I'll, I'll have to start with Memo because this is Memo's brainchild. Tugs talks. This is his program. This is not ours. This is not mine. Memo, uh, uh, Guillermo Ponce de Leon Bestras, I will be mispronouncing it every time, Memo, is, is a very famous general bariatric endocrine surgeon in Mexico, is a great friend of mine. He's the conceiver you know, and coordinator of Tug's Talks program. And, uh, and we have on the panel today, uh, my great friends, uh, Dr. Mahendra Narwadia and Dr. Nadele Garcia and Dr. Rui Ribeiro. So Memo, over to you to run the program. I'll, I'll shut up and I'll stay in the background listening to everything. Thank you very much, Professor. Today we have the honor of uh, having Professor Nathan Sondel as the speaker. So <clears throat> I really want to thank again uh, to all the rest of the Talk Talks team. Obviously, today we have uh, Dr. Naideli Garcia and Professor Narwaria as co-coordinators. So we have a very complete and a magnificent team. Obviously, as you may notice, the Talk Talks and the name of the, of the, the talks came from the talks from the, this society that Professor Mahower created and it's going up every time. And now we are leading and we are reaching 4,000 uh, 4, um, surgeons in more than 110 countries all around the world. So, but we changed this and we created this acronym to create it and to focus so what we are trying to, to give and to reach. Talks, tenacious, unique, and great surgeons. So we are now going to listen a uh, unique and great surgeon and tenacious surgeon, Professor Nathan Son. The objectives of these talks are to inspire, motivate, guide, and encourage young and not so young surgeons. So, these are designed to listen, experience, and recognize surgeons talking about their personal history, achievements, their journey to succeed, failures and overcomes, creation and implementation of their ideas, and their role as mentors. So this is a space designed to introduce and encourage young and not so young surgeons to the path of invention, growth, and leadership in surgery. And obviously the main concept of this is to inspire. As I was telling you, we have the honor to have today, Professor Nathan Sondel as main speaker. <clears throat> Professor Nathan Sondel is a world-class general surgeon, laparoscopic and bariatics. He's a clinical uh, professor of the surgery at the University of Buffalo in New York, USA. Additionally, Dr. Sondel is a consultant bariatric surgeon of the program of the Fundación in Santa Fe, Bogotá, and at the Jackson North Medical Center in Miami. He has trained hundreds of surgeons and fellows in bariatric and minimal invasive surgery. He has participated and developed different training programs such as the LAP project. He's the current uh, president of the International Federation of Societies of Endoscopic Surgeons, and he's a former governor of the ACS Florida chap. Uh, and obviously the, uh, he was a uh, former executive director of the FELAC and has coordinated different meetings and congresses 
including the president, uh, the president IFSU meeting that will be held in Miami. He has published more than 75 scientific articles, 16 book chapters, and is the editor or co-editor of at least eight books. Additionally, he is a member of the different uh, editorial boards, including Obesity Surgery, SORT, Bariatic Times, Surgical Laparoscopica, and many others. Dr. Sungle has received uh, more than 34 awards. He received uh, the Sages International Ambassador in 2015, the ASMBS Master Educator Award in 2017, uh, the ASMBS Surgical Innovation Award in 2018, and Master of Colombian Surgery. And recently he was awarded at, with the Outstanding Achievement Award at the ASMBS. So please, Dr. Sundel, you have the lights on and please share us your, your journey and all the things that we need to know. First, uh, good evening for you guys. For me, it's morning here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, I want to thank for the invitation. I think it's, uh, I'm not sure I'm a talk. I'm, I'm still very young for that. When they give you all this award, I think they want me to retire. I mentioned that to Kamal in Cartagena. So I'm not very good at talking about me. So I'm going to present uh, two presentations that they did to me when I was president of IFSO in Rio de Janeiro. And then when I give the Masters of Surgery, that second one is in Spanish, so I'm going to translate for you. But I'm going to start when a friend of mine introduced me during my presidential session in 2016. So if you allow me, I'm going to share the screen. Paul, I want to thank you, Dex. Board of, of, if, of IFSO, the Scientific Committee of the 21st World Congress, and Dr. Nathan Sundel for inviting me to make this introduction. Nathan, we are here. Thank you very much. Okay. Dr. Sundel's history begins far away from here, from Lithuania, the city of Kaunas. Kaunas is the second city of this country. Look at where Kaunas is. Mr. Salomon Sundel and Mrs. Sophia Friedman left Kaunas in Lithuania by the end of 1920s. They got married before arriving in Colombia and settled their home in Bogota. And the other line of the history of Dr. Sundel coming from Poland, from the small city of Ivaniska in the Eastern Europe. You can see where Ivaniska is and how small is this town. Mr. Alter Majerovic and Mrs. Haya Lederman traveled all the way from Ivaniska, Poland to Colombia and settled in Bogota also. Mr. David Sundel and Mrs. Perla Majerovic were born in Colombia. They married years after. They had four children, Fanny, Nathan, Abraham, and Aaron. Aaron is missing in this photo as he wasn't born yet, but you can see the face of Nathan at the end of the right of this picture. His family and friends recognized Nathan as a clever and restless boy. Here we can see Nathan's smiling face when he had her bar with bar. During his adolescent years, he managed his time between the sports and the social and familial activities. Here you can see Nathan participating in Macabiadas in 1975, and you can see Nathan with his brothers, Nathan, uh, Abraham, and Aaron, 
look at the look of Natana, this John Travolta look. He studied at Colombo Hebreo School in Bogota and got his bachelor degree in 1976 at the age of 16 years. He began his medical medicine studies in 1976 at the Havariana University in Bogota. You can see the admission register here is the original admission register with this signature and the photo of Nathan at this moment. In the university has this register. You know. He graduated in 1982. Look at the proud parents of Natan at this moment. In 1984, he began his residency in Bogota at La Samaritana Hospital, attached to the Javeriana University, where he obtained his degree as a specialist in general surgery in 1988. Look at our hospital, it's a beautiful hospital. At this point, I want to make a special mention to our professor, Dr. Alvaro Caro. Those who had the privilege of being students of Dr. Alvaro Caro received from him his immense teaching generosity. I admire his eternal intellectual youth and enjoy his unmatched cheerful personality. That was Dr. Caro that made Nathan and me as a surgeon. I wrote these words for the funeral of Dr. Caro, but gathering all the information for this presentation of Dr. Nathan Singer, I realized very proud for you today. I don't know where. During and after his residency, Dr. Sundel did different post postgraduate studies and visiting fellowships in USA and England in cardiovascular surgery and transplantation. During 1990s, Nathan focused his interest in laparoscopic surgery in different areas, such as cholecystectomy, advanced laparoscopy, colon surgery, inguinal hernia. This decade was special for Nathan's teaching capabilities. He was permanently teaching of the laparoscopic techniques in many scenarios. You can see here, um, a clear example of these teaching activities. Once more, thank you, Nathan. Combining his academic activities, he worked at Fundación Santa Fe de Bogota Hospital and occupied different positions. During these years, he combined his practice with academic positions in several medical schools. As in between 2003 and 2006, he was consultant of the Cleveland Clinic at West Point, Florida. In 2006, he started his second residence at Temple University at West Penn Hospital and got his degree as general surgeon in 2008. Then he went to Florida International University as professor of surgery and vice chairman of the surgery department at Herbert Wareham College of Medicine. Here we can see Nathan at the ceremony when he was recognized a fellow of the College of American College of Surgeons. And here you can see the certificate of American Board of Surgeons. These are Nathan's children. Andrea. Salomon and Valerie. Andrea is 24 at this moment. He is studying neurosciences at NYU. Salomon is 21. He's in college in Florida and will begin law school next year. And Valerie, she is 19. She's in college in Florida, studying marine biology. They are the engine of his life and main source of pride. For sure, Nathan, thank you. Beautiful family. Now you can see how much work Dr. Sundel has produced. 
His academic activities are several, and we can group them in papers and abstracts, manuscripts, books, book chapters, invited lectures, award recognition and speeches, and you can see the numbers. About scientific societies, Dr. Fundel is a member of 35 <coughs> scientific societies. He has participated in the board of directors of 10 societies. He has worked very close with these six societies, Alase, Sages, ASMBS, ACS, IFSE, IFSO, where he has held important positions. Specifically with IFSO, Dr. Sunder was president of ISLO Latin American between 2013 and 2015. From 2014 to date, he has been chairman of the corporate committee. He's the president of IFSO from 2015 to date, as you know. Dr. Sunder's achievement during this, his IFSO presidency, two new societies brought to IFSO, Honduras and Malaysia, 1,000 new members, active work with corporate committee with 11 members, Et ethics committee was created, synergy with other societies, as World Obesity Federation and European Laparoscopic Society. 19 countries visited, second IFSO World Registry, and first IFSO symposium held in Guangzhou, China. Dr. Sundel receiving his membership of the Chinese society and all the faculty members at Guangzhou Congress. Congratulations, Nathan. That's a big success. Now, I want to please listen to the message of... I'm going to advance this because this is my mother in Spanish, so I'm going to advance this. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay, Otto. Now, please enjoy this video. Nati. Oh, sorry. Fly me to the moon. Let me play among the stars. Let me but I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop this one. I'm gonna share the other one. That's okay. Yes, please, Nathan, go ahead. Thank you. And then we'll, have, we'll, we'll ask yes. you questions to ask you things that you don't want to share, but we want to hear from about. So, so you go ahead first and then we'll ask you things. Yes, yes. I mean, I'm, I told you I'm not very good at this. So No, no, but we, 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 are, we are good at, uh, at interviewing uh, uh, our panelists, Nathan. So, so we've got a good panel here. Thank you. Can you see this one? Um, not yet. Can you see it? No. Um, not yet, no, not no. Okay, then let me share again. You may have to unshare and then share. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I unshare already. Can yeah. you see it now? Yeah, 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 we can see it now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. It's in Spanish, so I'm gonna. This is very similar. So I think it's the same. Uh, well, this is like an update from him. Yeah. Okay. It's in Spanish, so I'm gonna mention what is similar. So yeah, yeah. Uh, he mentioned I had to do two years of residence in the US again to get the boards. I was very lucky. You're supposed to do five years. They gave me three years of credit, so I did two. I did four months of internship, and I did uh, eight months of fourth year and chief resident one year. Uh, in four, in three years, I need to present twelve tests and become board certified, and that's the darkest years of my life uh, because I was almost forty, and the, the American has the tendency to punish the residents for no reason at all. So it was, it was tough, but yeah, you do what you have to do. Then I became fellow of the college, as you mentioned, and my kids are now uh, bigger ones. This is some of the professorship I got now. Uh, I increased my papers to 300, my presentation up to 500. Uh, now I have like 42 awards. Uh, I think they want me to retire, as I mentioned before. So this is what's last year for me. This is the biggest award a surgeon can get in Colombia. Uh, he put these two books because during the pandemic, 
And I will, I will remove it a little bit because I think it's important for the young guys to understand that during the pandemic, uh, even I didn't work for a year because uh, the pandemic, I wrote two books. Uh, I spent my time writing. Uh, I spent time taking care of the dogs or the cats of my kids because I don't have any animals. I have three kids, two dogs, two cats, uh, but there are theirs, but, but I, I, I take care of them with them. Uh, and then uh, I publish a little bit these books, you know, so, okay. These two books, I, I cannot be able to find it. I'm not very good at this either, but they're gonna come. The more I stop it, the more it's gonna destroy it. So I'm gonna move on. So I got these awards then. Uh, one, I'm going to show you a small presentation when I finish. It was given last year for a career in innovation. Then we went to Barcelona during the World Congress of IFSES is my presidency. I'm still waiting for Miami that is going to come next year. So hopefully most of you can make it because I look forward. To, we're talking with people like Ruth, Kamal, so I expect everybody to be here. I've been preparing this meeting for three years and it's, it's, it's been killing me uh, because every everything changes. So this is another message from my mother. And this is a lot of people that I had relations in the past. My residents in Colombia, my friend from over the world, I met amazing people. I work a lot there. So I'm gonna finish this one. And then I'm gonna go for the last one that is different. It's totally different. Uh, the last one is uh, Scott Chicora. Can you see it, Dai? Yep. Yes, we can see it then. Thank so Scott you. Chikora last year gave me what is called the Walter Poyles Award for a career on the edge of innovation. So I went to Washington, they give you the award. So he asked me to make a small presentation. And the good thing is that he made me remind things that I did very young that I didn't remember. So, so I decided to start with this one. And it's true, the electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. So when people think that doing new things is crazy, that we have good things, yeah, we have, but we, we need to change improving. And I'm not even very good at doing puzzles. So I'm not uh, very good with my hands or anything. Surgery, it was like a gut uh, given to me. So when I was resident, it was a very poor hospital, like the hospital you have in your countries. So we need to invent things that our patients didn't have. So our patient didn't have the, the incentive spirometers. So what we did is we took the X-ray films that we don't have it anymore in our hospital. We cleaned them with Clorox, and then we used two straws and a foam a ball, and we create a spirometer for the patient. So they were free, they were very cheap. We created for them and that's the only pulmonary therapy our patients had. Uh, and as you will see, because with my friend, we decided to try another one. They were perfectly, they did very cheap. They were perfectly, uh, and, and we were able to use them all the time, as you can see here. So the other thing, we didn't have enough sutures. So we bought nylon for fishing, and we used the hypodermic needles of the syringes. And we put, a, a, we cut the needle, we put the nylon inside it, and then we close it. And then we send them to sterilization. It was a time when this was allowed because it's not like the whole regulation you have now, but that's the only way we have to close patients at the hospital sometimes. It was a, a lot of trauma, a lot of things in the hospital. So you need to do what you have to do. And the other thing we did is when we start to do a open abdomen, as you recall, it was designed in, in Colombia. So I, I call a friend who has a, a, he does dresses and jeans and pants. So I said, can you do meshes with zipper for us? Because we needed to close our patients. So with the polypropylene and the zipper. And if you notice here, we even put the cover of when you close the zipper, like you have it in your jeans, so you're not gonna grab any organ, this is the same. So we use this for more than two years. 
And as you can see here, we explore our abdomens with that. And, and then Scotchy Cora made me remind all this thing that we did when we were resident that we didn't even consider important then. It was that you need to do them, so we did them there. And now that I learned a lot of the world, what I did ask in return, nothing. I just say that they give us free devices to our hospital every time we need them, that they did. No patents, no publication. It was not important to our culture then. But I learned that necessity is the mother of invention. So you're going to do whatever you have to do for your patients or for your family. So then you always think like that. You know, you need to think with your heart, with your brain. So you're concerned about your patients. And you need to find a way to give them what they need, even there is no resources there. So then in 1990s, very young, we decided and this is a story that if you allow me, it's gonna take me one minute, but I'm gonna tell if that's okay. Please go ahead, Nathan. So the president of the syndicate of teachers in the country come to me three months in 1990 when we already were doing just gold bladders. I had by then 120 gold bladders, something like that. So she told me, I have a calatia. So you think you can do this with laser? You, if you recall, they were called laser then, the cold bladders. So I didn't say no. I said, you know, I haven't done it, but I don't see a reason why we cannot do it that way. Come back in a month, go finish your last dilation. And if you don't improve, I do it. At that time, uh, Ethicon gave us a small lab to do docs. It was allowed to do docs too then. And then uh, I went there and I said, I can do this by... Uh, thoracoscopy, I do my achalasias, my heller operations through thoracotomy. So I went and did seven dogs. Uh, and the only thing is you collapse the lung, you put the camera, and then you use the same instrument through holes in the chest. So I didn't see any problems. Yes, I will open if I can do it. Then the day I was gonna do hair in the hospital, the nurse told me, you cannot start your patient until you talk with your boss. So I went to talk with my boss, he's a very, very famous honorary member of the college. And he said, first, they told me three or four things that you need to answer before I let you do the surgery, okay? First one is that uh, she didn't have any treatment before surgery. At that time it was mandatory to have, Botox didn't exist. It was mandatory to do dilation. I said she has five dilations already. Okay, second, this is in the thorax and you are not a thoracic surgeon. I said, that is true. In this hospital, we did six achalasias last year. I did the six of them and I did them by thoracotomy. Okay, the third one, you never done this before. I said, that is true. I did seven dogs, but the worst case I opened it, blah, blah, blah. So he said, you do it on your own risk. And I said, I'm okay with that. So we did it one and a half hours later, no problem, beautiful intraoperative endoscopy, as you can see here. I do since then, all of them with the intraoperative endoscopy, we went through thoracoscopy and he took the Betamax, that was the, the tapes then, and he showed it all over the world what they're doing in their service. So the message for the kids is if you believe what you do and there is no risk for the patient because you already have a solution, Look, the images, the quality at that time was not that good, but you still can see very well how you control the myotomy through the scope. And with the Dorfland duplication, there were no needle holders. We sutured with two Marylands and, and, and that was a different timings. And you can see here what we did then. Uh, this is a little bit like a, one year later when they designed some troca for different style. Look at the quality. I recall that when we did gallbladder, the image was not that good. So we start to ask everybody in the room, Hi, look, look the quality of the image, but see, you can see very well. You can open, you can see the stomach. You use the same instruments you use for open thoracotomy because you only need, you don't need air here. You just collapse the lung. So this was a fantastic, uh, and you see, we can, we can bring the mucosa there thanks to, to the in, in, insufflation through the scope. So then 
we move to the abdominal one, as you can see here, and it's totally different. Uh, and we move for a reason. I start to do this operation in many cities in the country. And one day when I was already doing six or seven reflux operation, the anesthesiologist couldn't collapse the lung in one little town far away from Colombia, far, far away from Bogota. So I said, okay, I'm gonna try by the abdomen. Since then, I haven't done my thoracotomy. The interesting thing for me, when I did the first thoracic, thoracoscopic one, there was zero publication, zero, none. I didn't do the first one because three months later, Pellegrini paper came with seven cases that he did start before. But the fact that there is no publication, if you are happy with what you do, you have a solution for a problem, there is no reason not to do it. That will be the message for the kids. What else? I, 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 I designed one thoracoscopic instrument for myotomies that it looked like the episiotomy scissors that protect the posterior of the mucosa and then you cut them. I didn't ask anything. I just put the first two kids' name to them. But I, no patents. I didn't publish. So, so it didn't exist. I mean, it existed for me. It exists for my hospital, for my country, for the teachings, but it didn't exist in the world. Then when I saw publications later, I was very happy that we were doing well, esophagectomies. I was doing esophagectomies in 1996, uh, as you can see here, uh, but I didn't publish them until I moved to the US. So uh, this is my first transhiatal esophagectomy. Uh, recently I was in Tijuana, and now I know I've been doing this for 27 years because I met the son of one of my patients in Mexico that he told me that his mother died 26 years after the surgery for another disease. So I did his surgery in Colombia 26 years ago. So innovation is not only uh, things, but you need to publish them. Finally, when I came and I became with the Cleveland Clinic, some kind of, they give me a restricted license. So I published with them. So I learned that if it is not published, that's not exist. So it took me, you notice how long, I mean, like 15 years to understand that because we grow in a culture that publication doesn't mean anything. So let's publish innovation. Then I go and publish innovation. This is the first publication of endoscopic removal of eroded bands that we did with the group of Brazil and ourselves. And you're very happy. You publish more than 70 cases. You're happy. They accepted the publication in sorts, so you cannot be happier. And then they give you shit, in, I'm sorry, in an editorial board that you cannot imagine, you know? So you public innovation, you public something that has nobody ever done, removal of this, uh, and they give you crap for professor like Paul O'Brien, you know, it's not like uh, anybody, they give you crap. Then you present, you discuss, and you let it rain. There's nothing you can do as long as you're happy with your doing. If you believe in what you're doing, you do it ethically, you do it properly. There is always be somebody who tell you not. I'm gonna give you another two examples when my ears went red. So we published in 2010, the first dilation with achalasia balloons for strictures after sleep gastrectomy. I cannot even tell you what I heard those days. And this is what everybody does today. Uh, so I learned, so they were published, they are there. We present them then, and we present the casuistic. It went very well. Still, they gave you a, a lot of problems, but you believe in that. The other example is this one. The first time I was in Israel, that Raul Rosenthal invited me, I presented septotomies, achalasia balloon dilation for leaks of the sleeve. And they didn't even talk to me. They turned to Raul and they asked him, who is this guy that you invited here telling us this thing? This is crazy. So now is the chapter of the sages, bariatric endoscopic things that is gastric septotomy for internal drain of an abscess. So what did I learn? Be very well prepared. Never take it personal. It's not personal. Even when it's personal, it's not personal. Keep learning, believe in yourself, but if you are wrong or change opinion, you just admit it and move on. I mean, everybody commit mistakes, you just admit it and move on. Then we start to publish the suturing. 
we published a long time ago, the suturing with the endoscopic suturing, as you can see here. We were one of the first ones to use it in a trials we did in Dominican Republic and Panama. Uh, we published this with a big group from the US, from Italy, uh, from, from, from Brazil. And then I learned that you need to patent that. So we patent that procedure. I didn't even know what a patent was. So they tell you that you need to patent the, the procedure. You need to patent the suture. Uh, then they call you inventor. That, that is. So I learned that you publish and you can patent procedures and you can patent modifications of the procedure. I don't know what the reason for that because I don't think nobody's going to steal that. But I'm not making any money there, but uh, they make you patent this. And then when we move to the anastomotic uh, magnets that I love very much, that we couldn't do by endoscopy, but you can do by surgery when you couple magnets and they create anastomosis by themselves that I've been working in this at least four years now. Uh, then, as you can see here, is something, this is, I didn't invent this. They invite me to be part of this. I said, I love it, but I don't want to be part of this because I don't think that through colonoscopy, I can put my magnet where I want it because you can only go 80 centimeters above the ileocecal band. So I said, if you allow me to design a hybrid laparoscopy and endoscopy to put them together, we'll do that because then I can put it wherever that I want. So I read, I learned, I understood better and express better your vision. So then, I went to describe, I love philosophy. I wanted to be a philosopher. My father didn't let me. That's what I'm a stupid surgeon. So I said, imagine, and I look what kind of imagination I had to create this. So I didn't understand some of the terms here, but then I learned the, the imagination I have is called effectuative imagination. This is the one that allow you to synthesize existing ideas together from information. So you put two things that you know, and then you put them together, that's effective imagination. So I put the magnets that we were using for laparoscopy to these magnets, and this is what we're doing now. We go to laparoscopy and we bring the magnet with an instrument wherever we want it. So I don't need to open the intestine. The colonoscopy will bring the magnet where I want it, but I can move it without doing, the, this is the minimal invasive thing you can do. You go by endoscopy, you give the magnet, and then, of course, they made you patent one, patent the modifications, and the same with the barricade. Uh, this is a, a, an idea from Moise Jacob from Miami. So I was invited since the beginning, and I worked with him in many, many modifications. This is very similar to the Magenstrasse, as you can see here. Magenstrasse has complications, gastrogastric fistulas, leaks. This clip doesn't have those complications have the complications of foreign body, erosion, but it's totally different. So we studied this for seven years. We did the first 160 patients, and now it's gonna start the FDA trials. And we did modification like this one that we put titanium on the side because the suture were ripping through the silicone. So even if you do something, you can modify it. And now we're working on this because we found for people it was difficult to bring the clip behind the stomach. So we designing this instrument where the clip is already there. So even when you have something that you think is good, there is always room for improvement. You just do a small opening, you look for the angle of his, then you go above. And then once you create this opening there, the clip is already there. So you don't need to bring it later. It's already there. So that facilitates the process for other, other searches. So what I did learn from there, that innovation is not invention. It's, it's not necessarily invention. You don't need to wake up one day and invent the cure for cancer. You can modify what you have. You can innovate and make better what we have. So it's modify, improve devices, technique, and procedures. Also understand that even small things, they don't have to be superheroes. You give the place to, I mean, when you put a balloon, a balloon is not a sadis, it's not a one anastomosis gastric bypass. When you do a suture endoscopically, it's not a, a Ruiz one anastomosis gastric bypass. So you don't expect the same. You just give them the room in, 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 in what you do. So I'm, I'm really very humbled for this 
talk. I'm not very good at talking about me, so I, I want to thank you again for this invitation. I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you very much again for the invitation, guys. Natan, thank you so much uh, for doing this. And even though I, I, I thought I, I knew one or two things about you, uh, I clearly didn't know enough. And, and from the comments you, in, on the chat box, you can see, I'm going to not let you go just like this, Natan. I want to probe further because obviously I've spent some time with you recently in, in Colombia. I know a little bit more about you. You know, I think to me, you are an example of, um, I had heard some time, somewhere a long time ago that nobody can force you to live a smaller life than you wish to. And I think you are an example of that, that you know, nobody's been able to contain your, your, your vision of life and force you into, into, into any vision of, of what they may have perceived. So take, just take us through your journey as a trainee, Natan, because what struck me when I was spoken to you is that you trained for a long time and you didn't give up and you, you trained in several countries. So just take us through your graduation and surgical training in different parts of the world, including the UK where I know you've trained as well. So please go ahead. Thank you, Kamal. So, so I'm going to start a little bit early because this is something that just has been published once when I was president of IFSO. Bariatric News interviewed me. It's called Coffee with Nathan Sundell because I was president or because I was me. And he made me also recall what I went to medicine. And that's a different story. I was 14 when I was finishing high school. Not because I was mad, because my mother said I was giving her crap at home. So she sent me very early to school. She said, I, if I was born today, they're going to give me Ritalin of one of these medications. That's that, that what she said. So. That's why we need, don't need to stop uh, to our kids. We need to let them be. So uh, I went to my father and he, my, in my family, my grandfather didn't speak, I didn't write or, or read. My parents barely finished high school because they were coming from wars. The first person who went to the university, my family was my older sister, that uh, she is to the special help for children. Uh, there is no physician before or after in my family so far. There are all smart people. So I went to my father and I, uh, he said, what do you want to do, study or work? I don't mind if you work. I was 14. I was going to become 15. So I said, I'm not going to work. I'm going to study. Okay, you have one week to tell me what you're going to study. I didn't even think about it. So I went there. I said, I want to do theater, philosophy, or history. My father kicked me with his belt until I was 16. I deserved most of it. Uh, he stopped kicking me with the belt because I was 16 already in medical school a year. And I told him, I'm in medical school. How long are you planning to kick me with the belt? He stopped kicking me with the belt. And my father was the best father ever, but he, but he didn't talk to me like for a month, but he, he stopped. So imagine you're a student of medicine and your father is still kicking you with the belt. You know, it's not like he was killing me, but yeah. So he said, he just put his hand in the belt and said, you have one week to tell me one of these fourth profession you're gonna study or you go to work. So he gave me medicine, law school, engineering. And he said, even that architecture is for softies, uh, I hear that it's gonna be good, so you can study that. that. That's his, so you have a week to tell me which one you go to work. So, you know, I'm, I'm very bad in maths. I do maths my own way. I can give you the results. I do it quicker than most of the people, but I do it my own way. So I don't, I'm not gonna do engineering. I'm very bad at drawings. I still do people with four sticks. And so I, I'm very bad at that. So two were removing me. It was medicine and law school. So at that time, there were a, a, a series on TV called Paper Chase for the oldest one, maybe they saw it. And this was this professor that give them crap for hours and they make them study book like this for hours. And then on the other side, there was all this series of Dr. Kilder, handsome, doing amazing surgery, all the nurses love him. So I said, this is easy, I'm, I'm going to medicine. That's how I pick medicine. So, so, so now you know that, that, that that's what I went there. I hated uh, my first years. I just dated with friends, secretaries to get the test. Oh no, I'm, 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 I was the worst. But believe me, I was the worst. I deserve every kick in that I got. But then surgery came, and that was the most similar thing to art to me. So that's what I went to surgery. Then when I finished, I went to surgery. I did four years in Colombia. We do our internship before finishing. 
So I did my internship. Then we do one year of mandatory social service in the country. So I did that. Uh, then I start surgery. We do four years of surgery. I wanted to do pediatric surgery. But when I did my rotation in pediatrics, I wanted to help the kids. But when I did my pediatric surgery, you don't talk to the kids, you talk to the parents. And I don't like parents. So, so I, I, I'm pediatric. If you go to private practice, it's all hernias and things. And if you like real pediatric surgery, you need to stay in a very public hospital where you see real surgery. Then I wanted to do cardiac surgery. So I invented myself a rotation in, uh, in uh, Houston at the Methodist with uh, George Noon and uh, they, they went, Stanley Dudrick, they were all there. I mean, all the guys were there. And it was the most boring thing I ever saw in my life. Every valve is the same. Every, every surgery is the same. So I said, I will kill myself. Then a professor called me, you're bored, come to see transplant. So I went to visit him in Pittsburgh and it was even worse. So I say, I mean, this transplant take for 12 hours to these people. I'm not gonna do that. So I went back, I decided I'm gonna stay in general surgery like this. So I start to work there. Uh, then there was this uh, tragedy of a volcano in Colombia. I don't know if you recall, 20,000 people die. And our hospital was the biggest public hospital. So we get more than 300 patients to the hospital with the most weird complications, small bowel obstructions, through mud, through mud. So things that you don't see, uh, volcano lava, a long, uh, so one of the guys, the professor I mentioned before, came to the hospital. I said, we need to publish this. And we laughed. He made us publish that. So I have, I have a chapter in that tragedy about the gastrointestinal lesions, uh, but it was a Spanish, so, so it was not a problem. And then he made me go to his hospital to work with him. So when I started there, I was covering what today is covered by six surgeons, but uh, it was, this is 1988. So I was still like 26, you know, like, so, so he said, you, you're gonna be one of the best surgeons in the country, but it's gonna take you 10 years. So if you want to do it quick, you need to go overseas to Europe or to the US for two years. I didn't have any license to the US, so he come one month later, I found you breast surgery in Edinburgh, in the UK. I said, I promise I will not touch any other breast that is not social in my life. So I'm not gonna do breast. <laughs> so then one month later, he said, you are starting transplantation, liver, kidney, and pancreas in January in Birmingham, UK, and in Oxford, UK. So you have the PLAB exemption, it's already done. So that's how I ended up in England with no English because I studied six languages. English was never one and for whatever reason. So in those two months before traveling, I start to watch movies in English with closed caption. I covered the closed caption to, to learn what they were saying. So I start to read all the books in English. So that's why 20 years later in Miami, I don't still speak English well, but it, it's, I, I learned a long time ago, it's not my problem. It, so then I went one year to Birmingham. The first three months, I bought twice ticket to come back to Colombia. But I never came back because I told my grandparents, they didn't speak, they didn't read. They were 13 years old, they skipped wars. And if they took that, how I'm gonna go back saying that I'm a bumper person. So I stayed there for my parents. So I stayed there for my parents, that's the true story. So I, I feel ashamed to come back. Because even that I didn't have any money. I mean, I have a room. I, I, I pay one pound for the food at the hospital. So, so then they want to hire me when I finish there, but I have to still go to Oxford to do my other training. Then went back to Colombia, ended up getting married. So I never came back, but I have a position. I mean, I came back to finish, but then I went back to Colombia. And then after a few years uh, that I was doing very well here, very, very well. Uh, I did transplantation another six or seven years, but because laparoscopy started, I mixed them. Then I started to train people all over Latin America. So I couldn't stay with the transplant. So I sent three people to train. When they came back, I stayed another two years with them. Then I gave them the transplant program. And, and, uh, but we started, we were two surgeons in the whole country for, for transplantation. Uh, 
And then violence started for, for the drug dealers and things like that, bombs. So my kids just were born. So I just moved to the US, my kids, and I stay in Colombia. So 15 days I stay in the US doing nothing and 50 days in Colombia working. And I mentioned it at the ASMBS uh, during my award. I brought my three kids to the award and I brought them and I told them this. The reason I make you come to this award is because during maybe four years, when you were two, four, and six, I didn't see you for 15 days every month. So I did it for you, not for me. So, so that, that's basically the story there. And okay. then uh, I moved to the US. Uh, they give me a restricted license in the Cleveland Clinic because I proctor a lot of people here for the bank when the bank was approved. Uh, and then I got tired of traveling everywhere, it's, you know, so I said, okay, let me do this. I did two years of residency. That, that's another story that is an amazing story because I was very lucky. That's an outstanding story of ability and, and, and courage the way I look at it. Look, I've got hundreds of questions, but I know there are panelists here who want to ask you things as well. So we have two panelists and, and many other colleagues from TUGS. So I'll invite Dr. Mahendra Navaria, who's a great friend of mine, as you know, the founder of Asian Bariatrics, one of the highest volume bariatric surgeons, not only in India, but in Asia. Very rich man and, and, very, and a very, very able surgeon. Mahendra, over to you. I know you have questions for, for, for Natan. Yeah, I'm rich because I have friends like you uh, all over the world. So that is why I'm rich, not because of the money. So I really enjoyed since so many years I'm following you. I've read um, most of your articles and it was really wonderful to see your innovations and they're really taking it too. And I totally believe with you like... Uh, we need to uh, patent. Like I was in one of the sleeve consensus meeting in 2009 when I was in New York. And, uh, when uh, um, <clears throat> I presented my work of Ruin by Gastric Bypass after a leak, the whole crowd, the whole uh, audience was looking at me why you have converted it. But when I did it in India in 2006, I was not knowing what to do because nobody was doing sleep in my country. So I had a leak, first leak, and I converted into an gastric bypass and fitting gastrostomy, or uh, fitting gastrostomy, sorry, and it recorded, the patient record so well. So it, that gave me courage, and I did some four cases and I presented, and they were not ready to believe. And I had sent the paper to publication and they not they have not accepted service should be and now we have many publications even in fact uh, Raymond wrote about it after and we had a publication from I think uh, Spain uh, converting a leak to uh, fistulas nostomy and ruin my gastric bypass is now a considered procedure but yes initial when you are doing first time I think people are not ready to accept it so I can understand your situation those days you had tough time but really inspiring thank you so much my, my, thank you uh, i would like to just invite professor yks wish she's a great friend of mine professor of upper gi surgery in Middlesbrough, not far from where i live great surgeon uh, and, and a mentor and is on the tux talks committee wish you have a the question for professor zandal uh, welcome uh, prof I, it's a uh, so excellent uh, you know these talks just uh, on a sunday afternoon from in uk or wherever you are we're just here to get sort of adrenaline boost to our mindsets. And it's so amazing uh, to, to learn, to, to listen to, and uh, to get inspired. Thank you very much. A few sweet statements which you mentioned. Uh, just uh, uh, remind you to your illustrious career, any occasions where managers around you or your own colleagues stop or stagger your innovative thoughts or any, you know, we all go through it and I'm sure mm -hmm. uh, 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 in our career, so uh, you know that you can do it, but there's always an obstacle in front of you. Besides the management, your own colleagues. So how, how, how do you, uh, have you, can you just give a couple of examples and how did you overcome? The only people who can make your life darker are usually your colleagues. So, so I'm a very relaxed, I'm, I have a very good karma. I'm very relaxed, I don't scream. I was raised in a house that is screaming is a sin, so I don't scream. I don't curse. I use very bad words, but, but that's very Colombian. So 
that, that's different, you know, it, it doesn't have to go with education. It goes, we use very, it doesn't mean anything here. So the first experience was, uh, my residency was amazing because our professor increased competition, but no fighting, like I do with my kids, you know? So no fighting is tolerated in my house, you know? So the same thing he did. But when I went to work uh, in a hospital that is private with academic, and then when it's mixture of money and power, that's a very, very, the worst place to be. So, and I was very young. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jewish. I'm not very religious. I believe in God pretty much, but I, I think every religion has the right to, you know, but I'm, I believe in God. So the two people who came to me with threats and bad words, they were both Jews. So they told me that you community is mine, you cannot do their surgery, things like that, you know? So you, you are surprised. You think they, I mean, you expect the Colombians help Colombians, the Latinos help Latinos, you know, in general, humans should help humans, but you know what I'm saying? So that was my first experience. I didn't even know how to handle that. I didn't say anything, but I keep working my, my, my thing, you know? Then when I went to train transplantation, I came back. The surgeon who was there before, he had a transplant and all of them died in the table. But if you read the history of the, of the oldest transplant, that happened relatively often. So I came back, I did my first transplant, two hours, no blood, but, but not because I'm that good, it's because I trained later, you know, I, now we are. So he gave me crap for the rest of the year. I need to remove myself from the, from the program for, for a year until he quit. And you know why? Because people poison him, but people can poison you, but it's you to allow the poison to go through your veins or not. In this case, to your mind. They tell him, why the patients died before and now no? What the patient need the transfusion, the, you know? So he gave me all much, I needed to quit that. So that, so that will happen. I needed to look for another route and I found it in laparoscopy. So my message to the kids will be, from everything bad will come something much better if you look for that side. And the third one happened when I did my second residence in the US. I did two years. I was an intern the first first month. So when I'm in the middle of helping someone, one of the attendants called me, Nathan, can you help us do deliveries too big? We cannot do this. Because they knew I was already an, a surgeon relatively well published then. The problem for me, I needed to write both operation notes, now I'm charged of both patients because I'm still the intern and that was okay with me. But then the bariatric guy and the minimal invasive guy gave me crap for the two years. So that's why you don't understand either because I helped them do the first pancreatectomies by laparoscopy. I helped them do the first esophagectomies. And when you go to the OR, they scream to you, show you how you should put the trocars. I never complain, never. I only complain my last year when he made jokes about Colombian cocaine. And I said, so I left. So you need to go by your principles. You take the crap. You, as the British say, you know, my two years in England, I got very black humor, you know, very, very dark humor too. So the British said, you're going to eat shit, but with instruments, with utensils. So that's what you did. You eat it, you swallow it. But if somebody's insulting your countries, your principles, you don't let them. You don't. But you never will reduce yourself to do discussion at the same way they do. But you are absolutely right. Most of the walls come from your own, own colleagues. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Kamal. Go to you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Vishen, and, and thank you, Natan. Uh, from whichever angle I look at your journey, it, it, is, it is simply a, an outstanding journey. You know, as I said earlier, you just refuse to any, let anything come in your way. I'm hijacking Memo's show. Memo, I know you have a question to ask and maybe invite Nadeli as well, and then Rama, Ramon and, and, and Rui. So over to you, Memo. Thank you very much, Professor. I, I think this was an amazing message. Uh, this was very inspirational. So I, I think you mentioned before, but the, how you decided to forget everything you made in Colombia and move to the US. Uh, obviously, you mentioned before that 
it was because of the safety of, of your kids and your children, but you moved to a different country and left a big career in Colombia and start again from zero. How you took that uh, decision? <clears throat> First, it's very important that because I didn't want to study surgery, I, I wanted to retire at 45 to do what I want to do. So I worked hard to do that and I was doing very well. I mean, the Pope had the appendix removed and they interviewed me. Uh, I did the ambassadors of the US, UK. I was the surgeon of the embassy. I did surgeries into presidents, artists. So you are right. I, but that's what caused the trouble for me. Because in our countries, if you became well known, they assume you have money. And at that time, you enter a list of people that they can kidnap. And I don't mind they kidnap me, but I won't tolerate they kidnap my kids. You know, so, so I decided to move them. But I was never planning to work in the US. You know, the system here is, is, is different than, I mean, everybody wants to sue everybody. I've been lucky with that too. But, but so I moved them here. Uh, they give me an extraordinary ability uh, visa and I put my kids here and then I travel. So imagine how bad it was that it was better to have my kids 15 days without seeing them every month for four to five years that I did it for the safety. More than that, when I came from my trips in Colombia, we were in a close gated community. My kids go in bikes. I took my car and I followed them at distance until uh, my wife told me then, you don't have to do that. This is a gay community. We left the big outside, the door of the house is open. I mean, that changed now, you cannot do that anymore. But then you can. So I, I had that paranoia yet, you know? So uh, that, that, that's the reason. And then I decided, you know, I'm gonna do it for them, not for me. Uh, and, and you do what you have to do. I mean, it's your family, family is number one, so, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Naidili, I don't know if you have any question, any comment? Professor? Um, I just, uh, I just uh, want to say thanks to the doctor. Um, I feel so identified because I'm from Venezuela and I understood perfectly when you say, we have to do what you have to do with the resource we have. Absolutely understand. And it's so amazing experience. And I would like to know how we can encourage our young surgeons to write more, to publish um, their invention in our country. It is so important. <clears throat> you see, there are some, thank you very much. There are some, some countries that publishing is worth it. Uh, but I think we're going to a very wrong path in medicine, but I think we're going to a wrong path in many things in, in the world. But in medicine, uh, we're going to a bad path and in surgery, we're going in a worse path. In my two years of residence in the US, I hear all the time, surgeon don't need the hands, only the mind. And I agree the surgeon need the mind. But if you not transfer what you have in your mind to your hands, you, you're dead. So they only concern on teach them how to pass tests, how to publish. So they went to the other side. So they, they evaluate us for how much you publish. So here it's very easy to show them the significance of publish because they accept in a job because you publish. Uh, and it doesn't matter how much you publication, if you not can translate it to an appendectomy, the patient is gonna die. So, so we need to find this balance in both. But I was raised in a country that published it doesn't mean anything. So when I came here, I didn't want to work here, but people started to tell me, you do pancreatectomies by laparoscopy yet. Why you haven't published them? I said, why? I, I, I show you I can do them. Said, no, no, no. You need, because then you transmit to other people. You, they know what you're doing. They're gonna look for you for advice. Uh, and that's basically the reason to publish. The reason to publish, some people do it just for fame. Some people yes. do it just because they're gonna give them better jobs. I think, and I ask everybody, and you know, I have very, a lot of things that go with the Buddhism and some of the Indian culture a lot, because I think you're gonna come back or, or you came to this life at least for a reason. 
I ask every student of mine, every friend of mine, uh, God or the universe, whatever you believe, send you to the world for one reason. You need to give me one word. And I, I know my word. I know my word was education. So I know that long time ago. So publish was another way because I was giving lectures everywhere. I accept lectures. That's what I travel. I, I, I accept lectures in the most apart places in the world. I also five Zooms a day if needed every time, every day, because I think sharing your experience will help other people. Uh, publish, and that's what I start to do because they, they show me that publishing is another way to educate, to open door for people who will contact you then for questions. That's what I also think the meetings shouldn't end <clears throat> because when you are in a meeting, it doesn't matter where you present, when you finish, 10 people come to you, five people, 20 people. You are in the bar, they, they come to you and say, can I ask you a question? Can I discuss a patient? What do you do for this? That is invaluable. That is not even published. So there are many ways to reach surgeons, to reach people, and that's, that's one of the ways. So that, that's, the, for me, the biggest encouragement to write is either you are in a country like England or the US and they will help you in your career or you, you, you reach more people and they will find you and then you can share your stories. Yeah. Thank you, excellent. I just want to come in there as well. That's so well said, you know, this is so important for young surgeons. You know, wherever I look at great, great academic surgeons, they didn't start publishing before they could learn to operate. Most of them started publishing like you. I, I look at Scott Shikora, Raul, Ali Aminian, you know, when they had learned surgery and when they had something to say, not the other way around. And I think there's too much of pressure now on, on, on young surgeons to publish for their academic careers and all and, and at the cost of learning surgery. And, and that that's sometimes, I think, not, not giving the desired results. Well, over to you, Memo. I know you, you want to invite Rui, Ramon, Alexander. So over to, over to you. Thank you very much. I think we are on time, so but probably we, we can give a last message or last question. Uh, I see that uh, Dr. Villalonga is over here and Dr. Will Rivero, I don't know if they have any question, any comment. Yeah, over to Ramon, you first and then Rui, one concluding questions from you, you both and then we'll finish up this session uh, with maybe some concluding remarks from Natal after that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And not to, to stall some time to re, I would really want to thank you uh, this presentation from Nathan. I think he's a great guy. I've known him since the last 10 years and, and he has been uh, a person who has inspired very uh, number of surgeons and also myself for his character, way of thinking, the pragmatism he has in determining for example, this is a, has this a solution? No, okay, so we, let's continue. You go ahead, not thinking on what happened yesterday, but looking forward in the next day. And I think this is the character he has grown since he was very young, as he has explained it us. And so I, I really think young surgeons now should, should listen more carefully all the in, intrinsic messages that have all these uh, deep talks with the experts like uh, Nathan Nasoy, I am very happy to have heard him. I have been on duty, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I congratulate him a lot and all the organization for the, for the meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, oh, oh, Rui, any, any quick comments, questions from you, please? Yes, I would like to. Sorry, because I didn't have the, the microphone active. Uh, it is now. OK, uh, excellent talk, uh, Nathan, as usual. Uh, I had the pleasure and the honor to meet him many years ago. Even before that, I knew his work uh, on endoscopic field mainly and the evolution that he was uh, uh, producing with other important uh, guys from that field. Uh, all the times I heard to him in the, in, on the podium, on the dinners, on the social occasions, he always taught me something because he's not only a surgeon, but because of the personality that we could guess here. He has a lot to say about everything and to teach to people like me and I'm sure uh, most of us. So uh, it was a pleasure. I recognize your merit. I would like to express my gratitude and uh, congratulations. And I would like to finish with a question for you because innovation is, is like a worm into our brain. And uh, I would like to you, after your retirement, what are you going to innovate after that in, in what field? <laughs> 
the, the, the way, thank you, Rui, thank you, Ramon. So uh, I will say this, you see, the way life took me, you think I sat one day and decide to go every city and do surgeries. I've done surgeries in 64 countries. Uh, so I have license in four countries, three states in the US. So I was not looking for that. So I think, uh, Rui, you take the opportunities and you take them or not. I, it's not, it's, I don't believe in luck, but I don't believe in being that smart. You just decide and you do it. And if it works fine, if it doesn't work, you don't regret it because you took it at that moment with the information you had. So I never regret any decision that I've done in my life. But I, I, this is gonna surprise you. First, I want to retire in three different cities because I cannot live in one place for the way I've been living my life. So I'm gonna live in, in a city in Colombia that is Cartagena for sure. I'm gonna live in Miami for sure. And I'm gonna spend some time between Barcelona and Madeira, I guess, because I love both cities. So, really? so that's my plan of retirement. But the important plan of retirement, I want to learn to play saxophone. That, that's my plan of retirement. There uh, it is. <laughs> and, and from one of your comments, I want to say something. And, and, and I, I didn't think about it, but you're absolutely right. For me, teaching life is more important than teaching surgery. So you are absolutely right. And I'm gonna give you two short examples if, if Kamal allows me and Guillermo, is that, for, sure, uh, go ahead. for example, I'm, t I'm, t I'm telling you how, how, I, how I teach people because I, I, and again, I see life totally different. So a guy wants to do a reflux. I, I said, uh, you know, the anatomy player, it was not perfect. So I say, you cannot do it. The next time he said, I, I know the anatomy. I said, what was the last book you, you read? So he told me the book. I said, who is Timothy? He didn't know. I said, did you read the book? Because I read that book. I used to read a book a day. I, I don't sleep. I sleep two hours a day. So, so that's why I needed the medication program. You know, so. so then I teach them, if you only know this, you don't know anything. You know, I teach them about music, other stuff. But I think if you see my presentation, I saw I use videos that there are jokes, but there are no jokes. Mm -hmm. For me, every video has a message. And I think they're gonna remember that messages more than anything else. For example, I'm doing a gallbladders, and then they, they I don't, I'm not seeing anything. The guy do the camera very bad. It was my first cholecystododinal fistula after doing like a hundred gallbladders. So, it, so I, I, I stopped the surgery. I said, turn the lights on. So I turned the lights on. I said, first scene, I see a hundred naked asses. Second scene, I see a hundred naked asses. Third scene, I see 99 uh, naked asses. What's the title of the, of the play? I said, I don't see one ass. So can you show me so I can finish my surgery and I can do this? I never scream, I, I don't insult anybody. But I think it's the way you teach people. And that rule is right. When I sit socially, I, I, I talk a lot. Yes, yeah, yeah. you're right, Rui. But I talk a lot because I think you need to share whatever life experience you have with people. So, so I want to apologize for talking too much. Ever. Yeah, but your words are valuable a lot. Nathan, this, this is a journey of outstanding ability, courage, integrity, and honesty. And, and on behalf of Tugs, I cannot thank you enough for your time on a Sunday morning. And the two cities that you want to retire, and I have to say, I absolutely concur, you know, Miami and Cartagena have been to recently. <laughs> and, I, and I cannot blame you for, for, the, for, the, for the choices, you know, absolutely. So Nathan, if you have any concluding remarks, thoughts to share with, with Tugs, we'd welcome that. And then I'll hand over to Memo for conclusion. Thank you very I, much. I, thank you very much, Professor. I think we have a beautiful message, uh, very inspirational history of you, knowing all your path and your journey, how you move from uh, middle income or poor country to, to the US. And now you're a very successful and innovator surgeon who all around the world knows you. So thank you very much for sharing your history with, you, with us, uh, giving us this magnificent lecture. Thank you very much, Professor. No, thank you very much. I thank you again for the invitation. My last message for the kid, never allow money to be an issue not to do something. Uh, I got my first car secondhand when I was 29, when I came back from England. 
I was the only person who went in bus to my university because I went with a scholarship. Money doesn't mean anything to prevent you to do what you do. You're gonna find it like I did in the university playing poker or billiards, or you're gonna find it working on the side, uh, but you're gonna find it. But that's that cannot prevent you. Money cannot be excused to not do anything. So that would be my message for the kid. It's your mind that prevents you. Yeah. And on that thought, don't let money stop you. Thank you very much once again. We are grateful. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye. -bye. Have a good day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you, guys. Bye again, Nathan. Bye bye. And thanks, Ramon. Bye, Rui. Bye, Ramon. Bye, Mahind. Nedeli. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Wish.